good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to the moon. I'm your host this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by one sole co-host, uh, Ricardo Martinez, as Jerry is finally taking a vacation. Uh, and today we are very lucky to be interviewing Desiree Dixon, the genius CEO and co-founder of Thunder Games, a Bitcoin Lightning integrated gaming studio, and Jack Everett, the other genius co-founder and chief experience officer at Thunder Games. How are both of you guys doing today? Good. Good, good. very good. Thanks for having us. <laughs> it's our pleasure to have you both here. And now what, one thing that a lot of people will not know is that there's actually a secret podcast we have with Desiree uh, that we did uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, it's so secret that there's actually no recording of it because we forgot to press record uh, when we began. So this is her second time here today, but um, my memory is that of a goldfish. So this is all going to be new information to me because I would have forgotten most of the stuff that we asked. So that's the good news. Um, but yeah, um, it's good to hear that you guys are both doing well. I'll, I'll get started with a, a pretty straightforward question. Uh, and this is uh, for you, Desiree. Uh, you were at Lightning Labs um, before uh, embarking on this Thunder journey. Um, but before that, I saw that you uh, were work, uh, working for Women for Women International with working with blockchain, I think it is. Yeah, working for Women International working with blockchain. Um, I saw that on your on your LinkedIn. I just wanted to know uh, kind of what that was about because it sounded interesting. I'd never heard of it, basically. So I just wanted to see what that was about. Yeah, so I actually did a fellowship with Women for Women International, which is an incredible organization. Um, and they kind of aim to serve women in like post-conflict areas. Um, and so they wanted to kind of look at blockchain technology um, broadly to see, you know, how it could impact their organization, like how it could help. Um, and this was like a long time ago. Um, so what I actually did there was just like kind of do like, you know, I have a background in consult and management consulting, um, specifically strategy and operations. So I kind of just like dove into like everything they were doing, their mission, uh, the people that they were serving. And obviously like at the end of the day, um, the answer was <laughs> really just like the Bitcoin aspect. And, um, you know, I think that was like, look, I, I feel like I was lucky that I was chosen for the fellowship because, um, you know, it was like all of these possibilities they were floating around with like, hey, can we put like all of our, um, you know, all of our records um, on the blockchain? Like, can we, you know, manage like the food that we share um, with these women or like the courses that they take on the blockchain, the certificates? And I was kind of like, at the end of the day, you're a nonprofit and, you know, you're not a tech company. You're still like using Windows 95 pretty much. And, you know, which makes sense, but like, you know, you shouldn't like necessarily just adopt every new technology that's out there. So like, but how can you actually benefit from it? And really it was like, if you think about these women in, you know, these emerging markets, developing countries who have recently experienced um, some type of conflict, there's a lot of situations where the women, you know, have lost their husband or, you know, someone in their family. And with that, like, they often don't have access to the bank account, the family bank account, and that money just goes away. So, you know, Bitcoin is a way that, you know, bringing Bitcoin to these women and, you know, teaching them some level of financial literacy and getting the Bitcoin into the hands of these women puts them in a place where they're like financially empowered and like they're set up for more success in kind of these, these environments that they're thrown into. So um, that was really kind of my role there. It was like six or eight months and I kind of just dove in um, and really kind of explored it all. Um, you know, like obviously like I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, you know, I, I just like truly like focus on Bitcoin and even back then. And so, you know, I did like keep it very broad because like they wanted to look at everything, but at the end of the day, what made sense for the organization and what made sense for the, um, the populations of women they were serving was like really Bitcoin as a store of value. And, you know, to a certain extent, um, a kind of measure for transactions. But, you know, again, like I think the store of value piece um, for these women was the most important aspect. 
Oh, gotcha. It sounds sounds interesting as hell. Like I um that was I mean that's why I asked. Obviously, it, it seems like something quite unique. Like I'd not seen anything about that kind of before and, and it makes sense as well to try and like for them too like when you hear about a new technology you want to see if it's something that's going to impact your organization or help it or make things worse so it was worthwhile them getting you to do that research and it sounds like it was pretty interesting research to do i suppose um, yeah and i think we've we've seen a lot of it like people get so you know in their like donors get interested in these new technologies and like expect these nonprofits to like integrate it and and maybe it, a lot of times it doesn't really make sense, but yeah, it was a really cool project um, and an amazing organization. So I was just glad to kind of help out. That makes sense. And, I, and I've got a, a question for you, Jack, to get you engaged. Um, so my question here, obviously, is you're the, the chief experience guy, uh, the technical guy, uh, I, I guess is my way of uh, sort of saying it in a, in a, in a sort of a jealous way, I guess I've always wanted to be able to be good at development and technical things, but not, not been my forte. Um, I saw that you uh, also founded a, another game company, I think fire zoo, I think it was, um, what would you say uh, has been your experience? I, I'd be interested to see like what your experience has been uh, with developing non lightning focused games and then lightning focused games and kind of what your most enjoyable uh, experience has been as a software based developer based guy as a chief <laughs> experience guy <laughs> yeah so as you alluded to yeah i had um i started a game studio back in 2010 which was when the app store first came out so i was one of those guys trying to ride that wave when everyone it was all new just making these games for mobile phones um so uh in terms of like the difference between the non-bitcoin and the bitcoin games it's actually like largely this there's largely the same uh atmosphere at the moment because everyone's just learning about blockchain gaming and uh, everyone's sort of jumping on the bandwagon at the very beginning so from from this there, there is these parallels uh between the two industries but they are different like just doing a normal game versus one with bitcoin rewards or nfts or whatever there there's obviously quite a lot different because um you think about when you're adding value into a game it suddenly becomes a honeypot for cheats and either they'll ruin the experience of people already playing the game or they'll find ways to cheat your game and just like run into the ground basically and then also if you think that to give away value from a game the value has to come from somewhere and that's the users because obviously they're buying things or they're like putting their attention in the game and seeing ads uh, and some users are more valuable than others. And there's this kind of equilibrium to be met where everyone can get a fair share of the value they're creating within this kind of community. Um, so yeah, it's quite a big, it's quite a different, it's a different problem to solve when you put the Bitcoin into the games compared to just normal games, which are just for fun. When you put Bitcoin there for fun and have this honeypot. <laughs> Yeah, I get you. I mean, I, I think, yeah, people are already incentivized enough to cheat in games anyway, without the, the extra value that you get. I mean, I, I mean, I remember, um, I'll say allegedly in case this is illegal. I remember jailbreaking my iPhone back in the day years ago um, and doing all kinds of things. And I remember some guy at school, I didn't, this is obviously how, you know, how, how young I am. I, it's nice to feel young. Um, some guy at school, I had doodle jump, I think it was, and he was an absolute douchebag. So I was like, my plan was, okay, I was going to get a higher score than him just by like messing around with it. So like, I just used my jailbreak software that I had downloaded to just get myself like a crazy high score and that pissed him off. So, um, you know, if people like me are out there willing to do that for like, just to piss off a guy at school, then if there's money involved, then as you say, it's going to become a lot more challenging. People are going to be a lot more driven uh, to try and mess with your game. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, to see that. that's the main the, the, yeah, that's what like, I'm kind of the chief experience officer as you put it is because to make sure that when we add the bitcoin in the game is seamless obviously and works really well and and furthers bitcoin's mission and like trying to get it adopted as quickly as we can get in the hands of the people uh, but also that it doesn't ruin the experience of like someone who's just playing the game normally so this is like this balance to make sure it's not like just crazy a crazy like chaos you mentioned nfts and we've seen lots of blockchain games with nfts um, on other platforms, Do, does Thunder uh, have NFTs like in the games? Is that part no. of it? No, we we don't have any. We we don't have. Uh, we don't really see any demand for it. Um, 
I think because the types of games we create are around, they're competitive games, so they're not really earning games. We call our system not play to earn, but free to win. So it's free to enter and join these tournaments, and it's free to win some prizes. So people are just happy to win the Bitcoin. They're not like, they don't need to win the NFT to sell to get their Bitcoin. They just win the Bitcoin straight away. So uh, I don't think we get a lot of requests for it. Um, Maybe in the future, if we made a game that's more uh, appropriate for NFTs, like a collecting game, maybe we'll look at it then. But we're very much a Bitcoin only company as well. So we're really moving with the speed of the Bitcoin technology on that. Yeah, we wouldn't that on some random chain we would need to just you know wait until the tech was there you know taro whatever to you 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 wouldn't be interested in doing it on like rsk or or, um rare toshi the the nft thing on liquid um yeah uh so we always have this because we're a startup we always have this balance between like growth and uh adoption of our games and concepts versus like things that probably aren't going to be mainstream because even that's not quite so mainstream so our focus is really on the competitive gaming where we don't really need the well competitive and like free to free to win like prize draws and stuff so we don't really need the nfts so much as part of that um but if we were to do it yeah we would use those technologies like probably yeah, I mean, we, we could definitely, I think Jack makes a really good point. Like, I mean, I do think the NFT community and, um, you know, the Ethereum community do a really nice job of like onboarding and like the UX is really beautiful. Like, you know, we'll, I think everybody can pretty much admit that, but, you know, that like, especially with gaming, like the minute that like something looks awful, like we, a lot of our users, the vast majority of our users are totally new to Bitcoin. So, you know, we can't throw something that like is really difficult and really challenging at them. Otherwise we're going to lose them. Um, so keeping it as simple as possible. So even once like, you know, those technology, like technologies are, I don't know, at a place where we can use them, I think it would still be like, okay, does it make sense? within the game, just like in terms of like onboarding the user, because that's really like our end mission. It's just so simple for someone to come play when and now they have Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're totally open to it. Um, once there's demand, once the tech is there, um, it's definitely something we would be willing, we would love to explore. It's just, you know, unfortunately we haven't had really any impetus to do so. If you Yeah, if you, if you've got to focus on what's most demanded for by your customers and potential customers and then obviously you know what makes sense in the here and now there's only so many of you working on this right so you know uh, if you have an unlimited budget then sure you probably send people off looking at all sorts of technologies and integrating all sorts of things um i guess where one of the things i wanted to understand uh not sure probably best i'm guessing this is directed towards jack um but uh how does and obviously feel free again on this one to you can tell me you, you know only some stuff or not i don't know how much is, is sort of privileged information but how does one go about actually integrating lightning into a game like how does that happen how does that work <laughs> like obviously i get that w- when i play bitcoin bounce on my phone which i play sometimes um i can earn the sats and so it's, it, i just I, I try to understand like how it actually works on the like what what's going on behind the scenes that i'm not seeing mm-hmm. basically yeah so we have um obviously our uh, like income streams which is advertising sponsorships and in-app purchases that we get so we basically work at an average of how much we want to reward back to the users that's like a fair amount that they'll be happy with whilst we still keep some profit so we can like run our business so we have this like balance you know between how much we give away and how much we keep to keep the lights uh, on so when we have that pool of money we divide that into our prize pools we have a different prize pool every day for giving the prizes out the games and the users can earn a portion of that prize pool by winning it through um, a prize draw mechanic. So they play the games, they collect the little lottery tickets. The more tickets you have, the more chance you have of the jackpot. So the higher prizes you can win. Then behind the scenes, what happens is um, just like in a normal game where you have gems as your currency or 
like coins that you collect in a game on, the, on a database. When you win a prize in Thunder Games, you will also win, like, you always have a list of prizes that you've won as well. So how many sats you've won. It's just on a database stored on date, like Jack's won 10 sats today. Um, then when you want to cash out with prizes, we have uh, a Lightning node, which we have some funds on, and we have open channels to the major wallets that our users all use. And they will request, they'll be logged into their account, they request they want their 100 sats, and they tell us, you know, send us the lightning invoice although we do it via ln url um with, with the wallets and then uh when they send the ln url to us we validate that they're the person who who can get those funds and also that they're requesting the right amount of funds from us and then we send it to them over the lightning network just with a simple api call from our node and then when it completes when that payment goes through then we just like tick it off on their account that this one's been paid off so the little database entry that said that one this prize gets ticked off so it's kind of straightforward we really just we just have a list of prizes on the user's account pay them out with an, uh, our lightning node gotcha is that is that like a fully automated process uh, in, in in the back right? yeah 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 it's nice. all it's all automated Okay, yeah, that's cool. That's a little bit more straightforward than I imagined. <laughs> I was imagining like, okay, so every person has a lightning wallet and then like the two sats they earn are getting like sent to them in a there's no, channels between yeah. hundreds well, everyone, of thousands. Every, everyone already has a lightning wallet, don't they? Like they've already got yeah, the wallet yeah. Satoshi Breeze. So we don't need to have another one in between there. Um, we just like pay it to them when they want what, it, you know. What are the most popular wallets that you guys are seeing your users um Definitely, um, Wallet of Satoshi is number one. Um, and it, it's so simple, especially for new users. So um, that's the one that is like recommended a lot within the community. People kind of recommend it to each other. Um, uh, Blue Wallet, I think is popular. And I know I am pretty sure Breeze is, but like I, I'm always shilling Breeze just because of the like more non-custodial aspect. Um, but you know, that's like something we try and like progress people um, that's something we're like really working on um, is teaching people to like you know become like more self-sovereign so going from like using a custodial wallet um, and kind of getting towards the point where like they're getting off exchanges they're using non-custodial wallets now they have a like you know cold storage um, you know and that's something that you know we are working on and can do a better job um, of is just like kind of ushering people through that whole like Bitcoin journey. Um, but for right now, yeah, we just, World of Satoshi is definitely the simplest. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's funny because I've never actually used World of Satoshi. People always yeah, tell me- What like, do you use then? <laughs> I've got a few that I've used in the past. At the moment, I've used, I'm using um, Moon and Blue Wallet, but um, I just never used World of Satoshi and everyone says yeah. it's like the best, but I just never used it. Well, actually Moon Wallet is is, we know it's a lot of traction with Moon Wallet in the past, you know, couple of months, maybe six months actually, where it came out of nowhere and it's actually quite a popular one. A lot of people in South America use that one. Right. I, I like it because it's really good to onboard people. They're both, I think Blue Wallet and Moon are both really good for onboarding people who are beginners. Um, because like with Moon, it's like um, the submarine swap side of it makes it so that it's not that, you know, it's not that confusing. Like, like oh, I get my Bitcoin and I can send out my Bitcoin. And it's kind of like not that tough to try and give someone the difference. And if they mess up, they're still going to get it. Uh, into their balance um and then with blue wallet it's like if you really want to teach someone the actual differences and you think that they're ready for that then you can be like hey here's the bitcoin wallet and you separate your lightning wallet and you can move the funds so yeah i like both of those but yeah i've never never really tried wallet satoshi um and, and honestly i've got much more to learn about lightning i i ordered mastering lightning yesterday off of amazon so hopefully i'll uh, i'll work it out in the the coming months <laughs>